came up with the seven games trying to explain to people what it was that they should be doing other than lunging the horse. And it's a fairly easy strategy to just send a horse around on a line in a circle. Number one, if we don't move our feet, that's about all he can do once he gets going. <clears throat> and uh, in trying to get people to understand how to play with the horse's motion to get them to where they could either dance that energy around by by using rhythm and pushing it around the front and the back or even getting the horse used to used to things to stimulus that sh that should they should not be afraid of I started trying to explain to them and finally one day all of a sudden I went actually if you observe horses there's seven things that they do with each other there are these friendly things, these things that involve relaxation and confidence. I'll look over here, you look over there, you swat the flies on my face, I'll fly, swat the flies on yours. Very friendly, confident posturing. Don't be afraid of my tail. I thought, why couldn't they be afraid of my, why should they be afraid of my stick or anything that I've got? Any different than that. And I started realizing that horses keyed into this body language and energy and so trying to get people to use their body language and use their energy and not, not uh, misuse it. A lot of people don't realize that their energy's on because they're a little bit tense when it shouldn't be. And the energy's off when they need the horse to move. So I think and just trying to explain to people how, how horses, uh, how to be effective with horses is, I finally came up with there are seven things that horses do with each other. Before I met Pat, I was one of those people that lunged my horse um, because he was really very difficult, very high powered. And so that's all I knew to do is like, I knew I couldn't get on him right away. And so I was taught how to lunge him. And uh, I had all kinds of straps that I'd put on to tie his head down and side reins and shambons and all kinds of things to get my horse to be kind of round because he would want to run around with his head up in the air and his back hollow which now I know is fear. And so I learned to strap him down because he's not allowed to move like that. And, and uh, my horse never improved. I mean, two years later, I had all the problems I started out with, if not some more. And I think probably the worst thing was that a month after I got him and began lunging him, it used to take me you know, two and three times as long to get him tired enough for me to ride him. And then pretty soon I couldn't even get him tired. He just got fitter and nothing ever improved. So uh, I went to Pat Pirelli because I was desperate to get help for this horse, you know, to cure all his problems. And uh, the first thing I learned was to not lunge my horse, to do exactly the opposite. And I learned to play the seven games. And I'm telling you, those seven games completely transformed my horse. Even the most basic level that I was doing them, the changes were unbelievable in a day, in one day. And so when Pat talks about how, you know, psychology is such an important thing and these seven games really taps into the psychology of horses, you can believe it because suddenly they go, you know what, you look kind of funny, you stand up straight, but you act just like a horse. And then the better you play the games, the more the horse looks to you as, as their leader and it changes everything, both on the ground and riding your horse. With the help of this beautiful horse, Vanna, I'm going to teach you the basic concepts of the seven games. Now, in the seven games, it's really important, first of all, when you learn them, to learn them in order. Number one is the friendly game. Number two is porcupine game. Number three, driving game. Four, yo-yo game. Five, circling game six sideways game and seven squeeze game. You need to have these kind of tattooed on the back of your eyelids so that it's automatic. You could call out any number and you would know what game it was. Now, once you've learned them in order, you're gonna very first, uh, the very first time you play it with your horse, you're gonna teach them in order. And then after that, you're gonna mix them up as much as possible. Because otherwise what happens is you turn the seven games into the seven jobs and eventually the seven tortures. So, Here's why the seven games is really good. First of all, it gets you to be more interesting and creative with the horse. And secondly, it stops you being boring and drilling your horse into doing things. And it gives you something other to do than um, lunging. Because lunging 
it doesn't really build a horse's mind and it doesn't make them more confident. It just runs them around. In this way, you're going to cause a horse to become more confident. You're going to improve the relationship. You're going to develop communication. And even though what you're going to see here is pretty basic, you will see in all the tapes and courses that we offer how far this can go. Seven games relates to every single thing you ever want to teach a horse on the ground and on its back. So here we go. Friendly game. Just by standing around here, I'm actually doing the friendly game. Another way to do the friendly game is to be able to rub your horse. Now see, she's a little distracted there. So you want to be careful when a horse is distracted. And if she got too distracted, I'd move on and do something else. But she's back again now. So even just rubbing your horse, touching your horse, you know, like she's gold. Horses hate to be patted. It doesn't work for them. So you want to be really soft and gentle with how you touch them. And even things like, you know, going, how friendly are you in your mouth? Can I put my fingers gently around your lip? How about your eyes? How about your ears? And if that doesn't work, then there's ways to do approach and retreat instead of just go, I'm going to make you confident around your ears. You just play all seven games and gradually you'll find the horse becomes more confident because they get more confident about you. So rubbing, touching, scratching, finding itchy spots, they're all versions of the friendly game. So are things like this. Being able to just move stuff without your horse going, <gasps> what is that? So a horse should know when my energy's turned off or when it's turned on. And you'll notice when I ask her to do something, my energy comes up. When I want her to just stand still, my energy comes down. So you've got to be able to master your energy. So can I throw this over my horse without it meaning anything? Just like it would be my tail and I'm flicking flies off of her. This is also the friendly game. And I want to be able to do that over every part of my horse's body. And that will be something that happens progressively as you get better and better at playing seven games and as your relationship improves even to the point where you can do things like this and see how that doesn't bother her at all, okay? Because she reads me, not what I'm doing with my toys. Now, here's a carrot stick and string. This is an extension of my arm and it's not a whip. You'll notice that it's quite stiff. And that means that I can use this like an extension of my arm to touch her in different places without having to bend down. Like if I wanted to touch her on the hind leg, I wouldn't have to get my head down there, which is a good thing, especially if the horse is a little worried at first. And once again, I can use this like a giant tail so that she actually thinks that it's a nice, friendly thing, not when I pick up a stick that she's in trouble. Because unfortunately, that's what happens with a lot of horses. When you go to pick up a stick, it's because you want to go smack them. And that's not what this is about. So that's game number one. Game number two, the porcupine game. This is a game of steady pressure. And all these other games now, apart from the friendly game, are about moving your horse. So you're gonna move them with pressure, like with physical pressure, and then you're gonna move them with implied pressure. So first of all is physical pressure. When I lead my horse like this, and I put a feel on the, on the halter, then I expect her to learn how to follow that feel. And I'm gonna show you more about that in, in a little while in a simulation that you can practice. So this is a porcupine game as is when I use my fingertips and push her like this, just softly and then even increasingly use my fingers to get her to move away from me. So you teach a horse to be able to move their front end away and to move their hind end away from you, okay? I could also put my fingertips on her nose and move her backwards like this. These are all things that you want a horse to be able to learn. That when you put your fingers on, they don't lean into you, they move away from you. So the porcupine game is kind of a close contact game. It's when you're close to your horse. Now, driving game is where you don't touch your horse, but you move all the same kinds of areas. So can I get my horse to move backwards away from me and stay straight? Like that. Can I move her front end? away? Can I move her back end away? See? And if she didn't move, then I would actually go to tapping her. Watch. So I tap her neck here, tap her hindquarters until she moves. And see how then it's just a driving game like that where it moves the air and then it moves the horse. So now I've got 
two ways to move my horse, in close and a little further away from me. The fourth game is the yo-yo game, and it's about going backwards and forwards, but now it's like a medium distance game. So for example, I'm gonna get my horse to move backwards, first of all with the driving game, and then by wiggling my rope. Now this horse played the seven games, obviously, a lot. And I'm gonna show you what to do when a horse doesn't know how to do this. But that'll be a bit later. First of all, I want you to just get the concept. And then I wanna be able to bring her back to me and stop her at any moment. And then I can even get to where I go, move one step back, now one forward. One back, one forward. See, so it becomes a little bit interesting. So now I've got a medium kind of range game. I can get my horse to move way out there. And as you'll see in some of the footage, we can get horses to move way back. We just take longer ropes. So that's the yo-yo game. Now, from there, we build into the circling game. And there's three distinct parts to this. It's not lunging where you just shoot your horse out there and they just run around in mindless circles. This is about getting your horse to understand that you want them to move around, move away from you. Then they have to stay out there without you doing anything and then come back when you ask them to. So there's three parts to it. So I move her back. Now I'm gonna lead her and then support her behind, just softly. And now it's her job to keep going. And if she doesn't go, then I'll do something about it. And right now she's just at the walk and out the halt. So I'm gonna say, thanks for checking in. I'm gonna back her out again and send her a little bit more vigorously this time. And then it's my job to do nothing, her job to trot around. And I'm just gonna ask her to do two or three circles, not more than four, because it gets too boring then. And then I'm gonna ask her to come back. And the way that I ask her to come back is to just look at her hindquarters, and see she's already thinking about it. I'll get it going so you can see it. I'll wait till she comes past my shoulder, and then I'm gonna look at her hindquarters, like that. See? And the way that that starts is back with the driving game. That when you look at their hindquarters and you move them, they turn and face you. So the circling game actually starts putting those concepts together. So I wanna be able to make sure I can circle my horse to the left and circle my horse to the right, and that I can stand here and basically do nothing. That takes a little bit of practice until a horse knows what their responsibility is. Now, we're up to game number six. Game number six is a sideways game. And basically, it's taking elements of the driving game again. We're gonna move the front end, move the back end, move the front end, move the back end. So here I go. I'm gonna move the front, move the back, move the front, move the back, move the front, the back, the front, the back, the front, the back. Now at first, when you first do this, it's very hard to stop a horse from moving forward, so it's a good idea to put them up against a fence. So the fence kind of blocks their movement. And then you can say, move the front, move the back, move the front, move the back, and you just do little by little until the horse gets the idea. Instead of just trying to move the whole horse sideways, think about moving each little piece of the horse. And pretty soon, the horse will understand the game and it's very easy to do. Now, the last one is the squeeze game. And I'll just use this log here. And this is where I want to be able to move the horse through a narrow space. So between me and this log. So I'm standing about six feet away from it and then I want her to stop and I'm gonna move in closer each time until I've got a very narrow space. And this way, it teaches the horse to have confidence to go through those narrow spaces. I lead her through, oh, and we went over the log, no big deal. She tried to do the right thing. And then stop and wait, I don't want her circling me. See if I can get her to come straight through this time. So I just gotta direct her nose, there we go. And then I look at her hindquarters, ask her to move them. I would support them with my stick and just tell her to move them out of the way, just like the driving game, if I needed to. So now, once I've got those basic games working for me, I want to start mixing them up and using them. 
So I'm just going to use what's right here. I could use anything. I could use a mound on the ground. I could use a little ditch. I could use a log. I could use a barrel. I could use a cone. I could even put a piece of rope on the ground if I had nothing in my pasture. And then I'm going to do things with it. So for example, here's the sideways game with this log in front of her. Now she's trying to play the friendly game, which is to put her foot onto the log. Even allowing your horse to take a bit of grass is a friendly game. So you're doing that? Pretty fancy. So she's offering me some things there, which is really cool. Now I might say, I wonder if I can play the yo-yo game right next to this log and have her go straight. I think she wants to go over it. It's like, no, I want you to go straight back and forward next to this log. The great thing about having little obstacles like this is it, it helps you have imagination. Because I know when I met Pat, I had no imagine what, imagination whatsoever. All I could think about was circles and straight lines. And he said, you've got to find a way to be more imaginative because then horses are more drawn to you. They want to interact with you more. And so playing seven games with obstacles is what actually triggers your imagination because you just have to remember the games and then think about how would I play that game with this obstacle. So now let's play the circling game. It's going to be my job to stand still after I send her. Her job to keep circling and watch out for that log. Great thing about a horse learning to circle by itself is that they have a responsibility, so mentally they have to stay engaged. They have to keep thinking, because they've got to go, oh, I've got to keep trotting, keep circling. See, now she stopped trotting, so I just put a little pull on the rope there so that she would go again. So she has to trot, she has to circle, and she has to watch out for that log. A lot for a horse to think about. Then I could get her to change directions. And now she has to do the same thing. Keep going. And I don't try to make her feel wrong. Like there, she's checking in with me. So instead of getting her into trouble, <laughs> I just give her a little reminder. No, you've got to go again, and then I take all the pressure off. See how I'm not watching her every five seconds? I'm trusting her. Now I, I can hear that she's walking. So I put a little energy out way behind her. I don't try to spank her. See how she has, actually has more trouble doing a circling game over a log to the left than she does to the right. So they're things that I would keep in mind and go, hmm, every day I should try to improve that a little bit until she's confident to do it both ways. Now, let's try something a little bit more interesting. I wonder if I can use the driving game, or I'm, I'm driving her a little bit forward, and get her to just put two front feet over that log. And all I'm doing is putting, like she's very sensitive, so she doesn't take much. I'm giving her a little bit of pressure behind her withers, because when you give pressure from behind there, it tends to move a horse forward. And then when she started to go, then I slowed her down with a very gentle wiggle on the on the rope, just to say, don't jump it, just go over it a little bit. And then we can get forward again. You see if I can show you again. Slow down, I'm using that yo-yo wiggle. Slow down, and stop. And then I just leave her alone. See, now it's a friendly game when I do nothing. So she had a little trouble with that again, on the left side, she's like, oh, I can't stay there with that under my belly. So this would be something I would practice a lot with her. We got one leg. Whoop. There we go. And just get it to where that she, can ha she can be braver for longer. When she looks at me, then I just point towards her nose to say, look somewhere else. See there, I point to her nose so that then she'll follow her nose. 
See if I can stop her just by wiggling. And get her to just put her two feet over there again. Don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. See how she's trying to sneak out of there? Good. Now when she stopped, I'm not going to leave her there because that's good enough. So there's some examples of how you can just play very simply with seven games and make life more interesting for the horse and build their intelligence. You build their mind, you build their emotions, you build your skills of communication, you build them physically, so now they're getting mental, emotional and physical stimulation. And boy, does that ever beat lunging. You know, it probably sounds like we're attacking lunging. And we are, because if you put yourself in the horse's shoes and you go, well, here I go, I'm gonna run around on the end of a line in mindless circles for the next, you know, five, 10, 20, 30 minutes, sometimes more. I mean, I know people who lunge their horse for an hour. I mean, what is gonna happen to your brain? Some part of it is gonna go insane or you're gonna get so bored that you're gonna muck up, you know. And it doesn't prepare horses for anything that you wanna do with them. For example, you know, if you were gonna to learn to drive a car, they don't take you onto a round track and just go, okay, just drive around here you know, for like 10 minutes or maybe an hour because you need more time. And then let's go out on the road. <laughs> you don't learn anything. You gotta learn how to stop, to make transitions, to turn, to um, move, you know, around an obstacle, go over a bump, you know, avoid a ditch. They are the kinds of things that the seven games also prepares horses to do. It makes them more maneuverable. You're actually teaching them something and preparing them for anything you want to do on the ground and everything you want to do on their backs. Even though I got such great results, you know, when I started Pat's program, there was still a little part of me that felt like, well, you know, I'll do this and then I'll go back to my dressage and eventing and jumping because, um, you know, this is something different. And I'm ashamed to say that I, I thought that but I didn't understand how powerful it was and that really this was the way I should be training my horse. That it was much more fun, uh, it was much more productive, like my horses were 10 times better when I played with them naturally rather than you know, doing all the drills and things. And uh, so I was a little hard headed about it, but after a while I realized that my scores were getting better because I was doing this and so Finally, I just abandoned everything else I was doing and I thought, I want to reach high levels, but I want to do it naturally. I don't want to do it by drilling my horse. I don't want to do it by forcing my horse. I want to do it by playing with horses like I'm another horse. And then my horse will want to be with me and there'll be more exuberance. There'll be the relationship that I've always dreamed of. And the horse isn't just something I'm going to train and if it doesn't work, I get another horse. It's like, there is no horse that doesn't respond to this. But there are people who aren't willing to learn how to, how to do it. So if you're willing to learn, you'll solve every problem you have and you'll prevent all the problems that most people normally deal with. Simulations are the best way to practice the skills that you need to have before you go out to your horse. So with Katie's help, I'm gonna give you the basics for each of the games. It's not the only things you need to know, but they're the first things you need to know. So friendly game is number one. You already know how to rub your horse, I'm sure. You're just gonna put more feel into it. Now, what you wanna be able to do is like I did with the rope. Can you toss that rope at your horse, around your horse, over your horse, and not have your horse be worried? Okay, so I'm gonna be the horse. So here's the thing that tends to happen. Like Katie, I've asked her to do things wrong, okay? So Katie would, naturally just throw that rope at me, okay? Even if she tries to do it nice, that's gonna feel like an attack the first time it happens to your horse. So instead of going, well, you know, I'm really direct line, I'm gonna just get it around my horse, you're gonna start by throwing it behind you, okay? So throw it behind you and just like onto the ground. Flop, yep. See now, when she looks and where it flopped, all the pressure came off me as the horse. As soon as you put your eyes on the horse, they start to go, what do you want? Okay, now let's say the horse started to back away. What you would do is back away. That's it, hold the rope, back away a little bit. There we go. 
And then as I come in, she'll bring me in and rub me. Like, here's my nose. You'd rub me on the nose or the forehead. Okay, and then you would just start putting the rope out there again. And if the horse gets a little worried, just ignore it, unless it gets real worried, and then you just need to retreat by backing away. Okay? Now, if your horse has a lot of trouble, then you would turn. So turn away and start walking and throwing the rope out in front of you. That is how you take all the pressure off the horse. And then after a session or two like that, you probably find that you can stand still and do it again. So this is where you would start. Then pretty soon you would get closer, just flopping it out there. You try to put a nice feel into the rope until pretty soon she can throw it around my legs or over my back. And the moment the horse gets afraid, you retreat. Say, I get worried, you just do it over there, but you keep the rhythm going. So rhythm is an important part of convincing a horse that there's nothing to be worried about. Okay, so they're good things to practice on the friendly game. And even this, here's something you can do. You can take your rope like this and just, you know, with your friend, see if you can get that to feel nice. And they can give you feedback, like, see that? I went too fast and so it kind of whipped her, flick, <laughs> like that, okay? But there's a way to let it slide through your hand that it doesn't happen. So this is what you want to be able to practice because the first time that you throw it over your horse's back, you don't want it to go whack because then your horse will be confused. All right, so there are your main tips for the friendly game. Next, let's look at the porcupine game. For the porcupine game, this is about applying pressure and you apply it very lightly and softly and slowly and if the horse doesn't respond then you start to get more insistent about it and if they still don't respond you keep pressing with one hand and then you start tapping with the other or if you're holding your stick you would tap with your stick. Okay, so I'm going to get Katie just to practice this on my back. She's going to ask me to just move off of the pressure and the idea is that when you get the horse to move just a little bit then you rub again. So she's going to rub as friendly, apply the pressure gradually until she gets me to move. The moment I move, she's going to take the pressure off and rub, okay? Now see, she's pushing a lot, and just like yours is going to do, he's going to be, what? Okay, I didn't really do anything. Now, here's where I can help Katie. What I felt from Katie was kind of a push. I mean, I mean like a squeeze, like if you lean on me a little bit. I felt mm. like you were doing this, Instead of right? Like... Now feel the difference here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. That's different. <laughs> yeah. So what I what I did was I took energy and put it behind my push. Okay. Mm -hmm. Try that. Oh, that's really different. Okay. So why you want to rub first and then rub afterwards is because you want your horse to be confident with this. If all you do is just go with your fingers, pretty soon your horse won't let you touch them, and that's not good either. Okay, so very good. So now you use that same kind of thing to push and move your horse wherever you want. So I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to get you to say walk me around these things in a figure eight okay. just by using physical pressure and rubbing. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to close my eyes. See now she pushed a little hard there so like I, I kind of left. Now she adjusted her push to turn me this way, it's very good. Every now and then you want to be able to just rub because I start to feel a bit lost. Oh. See I'm getting faster, rub, rub, rub till I slow down. Oh, phew. That's it, I want to feel your energy come, like through your whole body to your fingertips. Great, now how about backing me up? Uh, from back here? Anywhere. How would you get me to go backwards? <laughs> See, if you just give yourself little puzzles like this, then you'll find that when you go to your horse, you'll have a plan about what to do. Very good. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so take your husband, your wife, your child, your friend, and just get them to close their eyes and try to feel where you're directing them. Because the better you get at that, the more uh, effective you'll be with your horse and your horse will understand what you want. Next, the driving game. The driving game is basically about moving the horse without touching them, 
but at first you may need to touch them to get them to understand. So here's how we're going to do it. Katie, just put your hands up like this. This is a good way to practice. And I'm going to show you first and then you're going to do it, okay? okay. So I'm going to start out here. This is like the horse, you, you need the horse to know that this is coming towards them and that they have to yield out the way. So I'm going to start here very softly. And as I get closer, I'm going to get like a little more insistent. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to clap like this until she moves, right, with rhythm. And see, when she moved, my hand stayed here. I, like if she moved and I kept following, she's going to go, what? Ah. It's going to feel like too much pressure. But when I do this and she moves, the horse goes, ah, I get it. I need to move away. So just try that, Katie. Yep, I want it to move. That was very good. Like I was just about to say to her, you know, let me feel that energy, you know, coming out of you and driving you. Like Pat's a master at that. He can just go like this and a horse feels it. Some of us take a little longer to develop that. And remember, this is just the beginning. But if you can get that kind of intention to come out of you, then it makes a lot more sense to the horse. So this is how you would move a horse's front end. Let's say that this is the horse's neck. Right, Katie, if you hold it out like that then I would do this on the horse's neck, like this. And when I started tapping it, when the horse moved away, I'd quit. And then I'd start again and do it until the horse moved his feet. And if he didn't move his feet, I'd come closer to the shoulder and say, you need to move your shoulder and move your feet as well. Then if the horse is facing me, like once I can get that on both sides, I can come straight towards it like this. And the horse sometimes doesn't know what you mean. And you can come right up here and then just gently tap it on the nose and it'll go backwards all right another thing you can do is you can take your stick and you can teach the horse to back up by tapping it on the chest it's the same thing it's the driving game tap it on the chest and when you want the horse to move his hindquarters don't walk into him like this you want to stay out of the kick zone you just hold him in the front and lean over and tap the hindquarters like that until the horse turns and looks at you. So don't make it any more complicated than that. You don't want to have to tap the horse physically, but sometimes that's the way it starts until pretty soon they understand what it is you're asking. And every time you've had the horse move, relax, that becomes friendly game again. Rub them, that's friendly game again. This is not about developing fear, it's about developing communication. So anytime a horse is worried, retreat, go back to your friendly game and look for that understanding before you start again. For the yo-yo game, you first of all want to be able to push your horse out of your personal space and then drive him back a little bit more and then wiggle the rope to get the horse all the way back, okay? So when a horse is right next to you, if you start wiggling, it just kind of makes this commotion and it doesn't really work. So move them out of your personal space first, all right? So Katie's going to do that by um, pushing on my nose. Just push me right back. Push me till I'm out of your reach. That's it. Now drive either with your stick. Yep, perfect. And now start wiggling the rope until I back all the way out. And when you stop, I should stop. But some horses don't. Like they go, oh, I better back up all the way. And then they start pulling on this. All you need to do is just stand still. And if they start to pull too much, just do exactly what Katie did and walk a little bit with them. You don't want to trap them. Okay. Now to bring me back in, you kind of comb the rope hand over hand. Let it slip. And then if I don't come to you, you just go a little tighter, a little put more drag, yep. And as soon as I come towards you, you go softer on the, on the rope again, okay? Now let's say that a horse does this. You're back here and the horse, you ask the horse to come in and the horse is like, nope, I'm going back. Now stand your ground, okay? Now instead of just waiting and waiting and waiting, and sometimes horses will like get bothered like that, Katie's going to just walk to one side, keep the pressure on the rope, pull a little bit, pull a little bit, walk, pull, walk, pull, walk, pull, and then it'll untrack the horse, and then you get them to come to you, okay? So you don't need to get into this battle of strength, because guess who'll win? You've got to outsmart them, not, out, not try to overpower them. Okay, now let's say that we've got a horse, let's come in a little closer again, let's say we've got a horse that doesn't want to back up. Vanna, you saw, backs up so easily, right? She's done it a lot and she's a very sensitive horse. But you might have a horse that's like, yeah, you and who else? You know, I don't back up for anybody. And dominant horses are like that. 
So you have to then learn how to get a little bit more oomph into your wiggle. But it's not just the wiggle that counts, it's the very first driving game that's important. If you can get a horse to back up from its nose with a porcupine game and back up properly from the driving game, then the wiggling part of the yo-yo is not that hard, okay? So let's say that we've done that and she's got me out here. Now she's got to be able to wiggle the rope convincingly enough for the horse to back up. So go to the end of your rope and it's not just the wiggle now, it's the intention that comes out of your body. All right, so you're gonna give me this look like I said get back, like a horse that would put his ears back, okay? And you start to wiggle. Okay, now send more energy down to the snap. More, more. And now wiggle your whole arm. Yeah, and that, stop. <laughs> as soon as I go backwards, you wanna stop. Like The moment the horse tries to do what you want, stop, because it's when you quit that horses really learn. That applies to every game. Okay, that was really good. So when you started to do that and you got more energy to happen here mm -hmm. and less energy to happen in your body, it's like it's going to project down the rope, then I really felt it come through here. Okay, now just a little tip. If you've got a bit of a, a difficult horse or a complicated horse in some way or an aggressive horse, then you can play these games on the other side of a fence. And as you play those games, the horse starts to learn that you're not threatening them, they get more communication, they start to respect you more, trust you more, and then you can get on the same side of the fence. But if you have any troubles, just call our office, go on the website, we've got thousands of questions and answers there for you to help you as you go. For the circling game, there's three parts, if you remember. So Katie's got me to back up, has to get me to back up, and then direct me off into the circle. And the way she's gonna do that is by leading my nose. So point my nose by leading it in the direction you want it to go. Very good. See, if you pull it straight backwards, the horse is gonna come this way. She wants to go, go out and around, and then it makes sense. And she can support with the stick. Now you'd use the back end of the stick instead of the string, okay. like that. So let's say she directs me over that way and I go like that, but I'm not really going, that she can put the energy towards me here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I move that away. Now, energy back here to say, get going. And as I go, the rope starts to slip. Okay, so I'm going to close my eyes. Oh, okay. All right, I got it. I'm going to be a good horse because I don't want to be tapped. I can't see it anyway. That was really good. So what I, what I um, felt from her is the direction that she wanted me to go in. Do it again and see if you can, like, just to get me to follow a direction. Yep, great. And she's putting a nice feel on the rope. It's not like a jerk in any way. It's just kind of an offering. It's like, step this way, okay? So try and put a lot of feel into when you direct a horse. Good. All right, now, here's the most important part. You have to learn how to do nothing, okay? So you're gonna back me up. Let's say I'm gonna be right here. Okay. So we're using a part of the driving game and the yo-yo game and the porcupine game all in the first part. Then you're gonna send me off in a circle. Not too far, good. Okay, now have your stick ready. The further away your horse is, the more you'll need to activate the string, but otherwise you can just use the back of the stick. Okay, so here I go. Now she's gonna let the rope slide out through her hand and do nothing. She's just gonna pass it around behind her back. If the carrot stick fell on the ground, that's okay. Just leave it on the ground. You don't need it right now anyway. So now, as I come around, let's pretend that I've done three laps, okay? Now she's gonna stop me. And what she's gonna do is look towards my hindquarters. And if I don't stop, then she's gonna pull on the rope just a little bit. And if I get faster, she'll wiggle the rope. Like, don't get faster, okay? And then I'm gonna turn and look. Now, if your horse does not turn and look at you, the problem is in the driving game, you need to go back and be able to move your horse's hindquarters and have that really work. You don't just get more insistent and start spanking on the horse while you know it's trying to circle because it just won't understand. So the better your driving game is, the better your 
circling game will be for the send and also for the bring back. Okay, so then when I'm looking, you just bring me back to you. That's it. It's got to feel like game over. The horse has got to go, oh, phew, I don't have to circle anymore. And now I can just stop and relax. Okay, now let's look at what would happen if the horse quit on the circle. Okay, okay. so you're going to send me out. Just send me the same, same way again, just so that I can talk <laughs> to the camera as we go. Okay, so here I go. And now I'm going to go, that's as far as I'm going. Now, here's where you look at the horse and you go, hmm, the horse is looking at me, so I need to resend it. Okay, so you just do exactly the same thing again. Get the horse to turn and go that way again. But if the horse stopped like this, then you'd say, oh, you need to get going. So she would still give me a little feel forward here, and then she would put some energy way out behind me, like way out, halfway back across the circle and just gently touch the ground. And that'll give me energy to get going again. Okay, just simple little things. Take it slow, think about each part, teach your horse what it is you want. If anything becomes difficult or troublesome, bring your horse back in and pet him. Whatever you do, don't punish a horse. They don't understand it. Don't get firm and rough and frustrated because then they just get scared or they'll feel like they gotta fight you. Just make it no big deal. Bring them back rub them, think about which game you've got to get a bit more clearer. Because even though there's seven games, there's really only three. Friendly, porcupine and driving. They're the basis of everything else you need to know. So when something goes wrong, come back and check on those. Sideways game. Okay. So as I showed you with Vanna, You're going to ask the horse to move away. And the first one to move is the front end. So you're going to take your stick and just gently move my front like that. Okay. And you want to move it a little beyond. Okay. Not just here. Okay. And now you need to move the hind end. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like that. Now let's say the horse keeps looking at you. Then you're going to go front end, front end, front end, front end. Now the horse is not looking at you. You're going to go back end, back end, back end, back end. Now you're going to go front, back, front, back, front, back. So whichever end's not working, you just put a little bit more attention there. Now, let's say that I wanted to leak forward. Okay, so we'll go back over here. If you remember with Vanna, when she started to go forward and I didn't want her to, I just put a little wiggle on the rope. Okay, so... Sending me sideways. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now I'm going to go forwards. Wiggle, 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 wiggle. Oh, that'll back me up. Just wait for a moment and then go again. See? And of course, the easy way is to have a fence in front so then the horse doesn't feel the need to go forward. But in the long run, you want to be able to do it even without a fence. For the squeeze game, the ideal way to teach a horse is to have, you know, something solid like a fence and the higher the better really because then the horse doesn't really think about going over it, it'll think about going through that space. But what you've got to remember is that horses are naturally very claustrophobic. So the smaller that you make the um, space, the more difficulty they will have. So if you're trying to get your horse to come through and he's having trouble, just sidestep one step over. And if he still has trouble, make it wider. Make it wider, make it wider until finally the horse will go through. And you'll learn a lot about just how claustrophobic some horses are. And then when they can do it at that width, you do it a few times, then you close it in. And over the next days, you get it down to where you can squeeze them through just a small spot. Okay? So now, here's what's important. Katie needs to direct my nose, okay, as the horse. She's got to show me that that's where I'm going, okay? So, perfect. And here I come. Now, if I didn't go, then she would just take her stick and do a little roll of energy out there, which would help support me to come through. And I come straight through, and then I hit this, and a little wiggle, and she tells me to, to yield my hindquarters, okay? Again. That all comes back to your driving and yo-yo games that you've taught your horse before. Okay, we'll do it again. Now, if I go over here, she's got to redirect my nose. Yep. 
and I stall. Then she's got to take more feel again and send me off. Good. And just a little bit of stick. I didn't need much. Wiggle, 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 wiggle till I stop. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Yeah. All right. So you don't want your horse going around in a circle. This is a straight pattern. It means squeeze through, stop, turn, face, wait. Okay. You might find that your horse comes through the squeeze like this, turns and looks at you and then wants to come to you. So you need to then use your driving game and ask them to go back. And the importance of getting a horse to wait is that this is what teaches them to be emotionally calm. Because sometimes when they go through something, and this can even be over a jump, any kind of squeeze can make a horse feel like, you know, a bit um, worried. So by getting them to stop, turn, face and wait, it actually gets them to go more left brain or more calm again. And if you let them just run around you, then they just stay, you know, kind of right brain and wiggy. So make sure that you understand the pattern of that squeeze game because it's very important. And that's it. That's the seven games. There's a lot more that you can do with these, but these are the first things that you need to know about it. And now it's about practicing, do some simulations with unsuspecting friends, get to where you feel really adept with the tools and what you're asking your horse to do, and then go out and actually do it with your horse. And don't worry about mistakes. That's all part of learning. Anytime things don't work out, just go back to the friendly game and take a fresh start. And pretty soon, as you get better and better at this, you'll want more information. How can I do more? How can I start doing the things that Pat and Linda are doing with their horses and their top students? All the things that you can do, everything can be traced back to the seven games. I think horses love to play, but they won't play until they're confident. And they won't be confident until they feel safe. So that's where it's the human's obligation to get the horse to where they feel safe and confident because then they'll want to play. So if your horse is not playing with you, then you've got to look at, you know, why it must be afraid. So there's not a horse I have not seen play. Even horses that you go, oh my goodness, that seems like the most unplayful horse. You watch them in the quiet, you know, times with other horses, no one else is around, no humans are around, they'll play with other horses. So getting them to play with you is the, the biggest compliment. Um, I think there's people that don't know how to play, and I was one of those. I was so serious about my sport that, and, and I'm quite kind of a playful person, but when I was around horses, I wasn't. And so I had to learn how to become playful. And I think, again, this is so important when you have a horse. If you really want to have that exuberance and something really special and your horse to run to you and say, pick me, then you have to learn how to become more playful in yourself. And that's what we teach. Something that's very important when you start playing with your horse is to use what we call phases. And horses use this with each other. They don't just go and beat each other up or just kick. There's a lot of little signals that happen before they actually deliver the message. So for example, like my horse is here, you know, half asleep. And if I wanted him to move back, the worst thing that I could do is just grab him by the halter and shove him back. So what I would do is do it in phases. I would do the lightest possible thing and then if he responds at that, I wouldn't go any heavier. But if he didn't respond, then I would go stronger and I'd come back to something light once he did respond. Same thing if you were using your stick to push your horse. You don't just kind of jab it into him. Start by rubbing and then softly push. Softly push and then get stronger. See that I'm getting stronger and he got himself out of the pressure. And then I start again softly and I push until he moves, but I get a stronger little by little. Same thing when you're wiggling the rope. Anytime you're using some kind of pressure, like a porcupine pressure or a driving pressure, uh, steady or rhythmic pressure, you start with the lightest it could be. And see, he's going where it's really light. If I had started by wiggling the rope, see how his head went up? That offends him. So use your phases. Be as soft and polite as possible. Count to about three before you go to your next phase. Sometimes if your horse needs you to be faster, you'll learn about that later on. But right now, be polite and then be effective. Here are some reasons why I think people should play with their horses on the ground. Number one, it's a healthy form of mental, emotional and physical exercise for the horse. It adds value to his life. Number two, 
helps people understand how to read a horse and a, apply equine behavioral shaping and changing techniques. It is one of the healthiest things you can do with the horse. It is engaging for the human. It's engaging for the, for the horse. Um, because there are so many aspects to it, it's non-repetitive. In other words, lunging a horse in a circle can be very repetitive. Repetitive stress syndrome with a young horse, especially if they just go into the left and they rotate over their uh, joints in the, in the same thing over and over and over again. And I think on top of all of that, that the psychosomatic aspects of it, that a young horse, when he's a baby, when he's a little foal, is keyed into synch synchronization. That's how they survive. They synchronize with their mother. If she's calm, they're calm. If she's uh, nervous, he better get nervous. If she's moving, he's moving. If she's stopping or turning, she, he better be stopping and turning. So to me, this is one of the things that it just really is fulfilling for the horse and the human. And it's, it's something that I think it helps us get our instincts honed, our way of thinking honed, without being in the saddle. And there's a lot of people today that don't have the time to get into the, into the saddle as much as they'd like. There's a lot of people today that their aching body won't allow them to be in the saddle, or maybe it's their uh, physical condition, maybe it's their health, maybe it's their weight, maybe it's their confidence. And this is something that, even though it's a bit avant-garde for, for a lot of people, they're not used to seeing people playing with horses like you see some people playing with their dogs. I have never seen this be a bad thing. If understood correctly, Natu and applied naturally. When you see somebody who knows how to play the seven games and is quite um, advanced in our program, they can take a horse that they've never seen before and within minutes do unbelievable things and you almost can't see what they're doing because they just know how to relate. But there are people who have practiced this, they've become very good at it. It's like somebody who really learns to become a very good rider. It takes time to learn to become good. But the great thing is that this is not rocket science. Like, there's so much logic to it. And when you understand how, really, how horses think and what motivates them and how simple it is to really get inside their skin and understand their needs, then just learning to become more skilled in your techniques really doesn't take that much. So I think probably for some people the hard part will be, oh, I'm gonna feel clumsy again, especially if you're a very accomplished rider or trainer. You've got to learn something new and it's going to feel awkward for a little bit. But if you apply yourself to it, it doesn't take long. You know, suddenly you've got horses that, you know, want to be with you, want to connect with you. They're not going, oh, there's my human, I've got to be somewhere else. And to me, it's like, yeah, it's going to take a little time. But from the moment you start, you get results. It's not like, well, in three to six months, you're going to get results. From the moment you start, you will experience a difference. Now that you've watched this DVD, I want you to be more than an armchair quarterback. I want you to get out there and do it. Go get your halter, your lead rope, your carrot stick, and your string. Get out there and give it a shot. Just watch what horses do out in a pasture naturally. This is, I'm sure, what your horse is begging you to, to understand. It's how does he do it naturally? And if you can understand that, 
And if you can get your head around it, and if you can try to emulate nature, and never forget, your horse is nature in its finest form. If we can understand that, then what we can do is we can start to open up the real secrets of success to horses. It takes love, it takes language, it takes leadership. And that horse is going to respond with respect, without fear. He's going to be light, responsive, and the bond that we can create is going to be strong. That's my only goal is just to keep it natural, keep it simple, and help humans understand horses. Understand them so much that it actually becomes innate, and this is what SAD is. My whole program is, is designed to help you have horse savvy, because if you savvy savvy, your horse is going to know it. He's going to, he's going to respond to you so naturally that he thinks you're his mother, and that's the goal. So keep it natural. Pirelli is natural horsemanship in a system where anyone can learn it, and anyone can do it. There's a lot of really good horsemen out there, but not many who understand the psychology of the horse or that can teach you the psychology of the horse. It's given me the ability to get inside the skin and the heart of the horse. So many other disciplines and just other ways of doing things have been task oriented, you know, do this, do that. This is different. This is a lot different. We worked, we rode in the mountains, and we had a pretty good time. But since Pirelli, it's all different. When I met Pat in 1989, I was in deep trouble. And being an English rider who was really focused on dressage, you know how desperate you have to be before you go to a cowboy for advice. And I was having trouble because my horse would just get totally out of control. He was so excitable that I ended up becoming an avoidaholic. I avoided anything that would upset him. So that meant I rode by myself in calm weather in very small arenas. And I thought I was doing all right. But the problem was that I had goals. I wanted to compete with that horse. And it, just, it just wasn't going to happen until finally I was advised to get rid of the horse. That um, It wasn't me, it was the horse. And for some reason, I guess being a girl, I just had a hard time accepting that. I didn't want to sell my horse. And yet I didn't have anywhere else to turn. And that's when I saw a video of Pat in the tax store. And even though it was a cowboy and he was riding in a Western saddle, the things he, would do, he was doing on that horse blew me away. And the thing that really got me was when he did a, a slide stop and there was no bridle on the horse. And I thought, if that guy can stop his horse with no bridle, then I've got something to learn. Because I've got about $300 worth of gadgets on my horse's head, and I still can't stop him at X from a trot. So I went along thinking he's going to help me fix my horse. Well, I learned it wasn't the horse that needed fixing. I needed a good dose of horsemanship, not dressage, not any other competitive sport. I had all that information. I didn't know how to get into my horse's head and I didn't know how to get into his heart. Basically, my horse did not want to be with me. He did not trust me. And yet, I couldn't tell. I thought that's just how the horse is. So that's when my life with, with horses changed. And Pat was not that gentle with me. <laughs> you know, he was very clear about what was going on and I needed to know that. And I remember thinking, you know, having been in horses for 20 years, how come I'm only just learning this now? This should be common knowledge. This should be the first thing that you know when you get into horses, before you get into horses. And that's what keeps driving us to help share this message. I probably wouldn't be doing horses anymore. I hadn't found it because <laughs> I did 10 years of hunter-jumper training and she's like one of my best friends now. I go and I talk to her and have conversations and she's been a challenge because she's pretty dominant and it's just 
shown me a whole nother way of playing with horses. Actually, it's shown me how to play with horses. I don't think I ever played with horses before. I think I just rode. And I've spent more time on the ground having fun than I ever did in 10 years. So it's just, it's just fun now. It's just really nice when, when a horse gives you that, like this little touch there, and <laughs> when, when you become bonded, and when it's more about a feel, a connection, and, and yeah, just stronger than, than any bit or any rope or something like that. Um, it's, it's a deep relationship, it's about building a relationship, a deep bond between a horse and a human. And through psychology, through understanding, through not being bothered about little mistakes that happen on both sides, not being critical, but having fun together. And, um, and that's what it's all about there. I thought I knew a lot, <laughs> but you don't know how much you don't know until you know it. So, um, yeah, I, I was frustrated a lot of the time because I didn't have the answers. And I'd only get firm when I was frustrated and now I only get firm or effective when it's needed, so it's a big difference. If you have the love for horses and you want, you want a true relationship, then Prelly's the way to go, the natural way to go. I found that out of everything else I've ever done, it just wasn't, it didn't preserve the dignity of the horse, and that's the most important to me. Horsemanship has kind of been stuck into this rut of just doing what everybody else is doing, just because everybody else is doing it. So I started going, what, else, what is possible? I started looking at, at uh, not just you know English versus Western, I started looking at circus trainers. I started looking at uh, dressage, racing, polo, cutting, people being able to do things with horses on the ground, trick training. And all of a sudden I realized there was a universal thing. I started thinking, you know what? If we can get the horses to play with us, if we can evoke that play drive. Now we've probably all had that with our dog, right? Maybe with our children, kind of get them playing and learning and stuff. But horses will only play either with each other or something or in an environment that they feel safe and comfortable. So how good does it get? I'm telling you, I have, I love to be astonished. I love it when my students get things that are not only amazing, but that astonish me. Silke Valentine from Germany, been in a wheelchair for over 20 years, and she cannot ride a horse. But what she do, what does she do? She's out there, she's got her horse doing piaf and passage and lead changes, lays down, comes around her, comes to her, loads in the trailer backwards from 40 feet away. That's astonishing. So, what I really want people to understand is there's more ways to be with a horse. One is with a horse, kind of like I am right now. I'm on foot, he's on foot. I got a line on him, but I only use this, this line for a safety net. The other way is with no safety net at all, at completely at liberty, and liberty has nothing to do with being in a round corral. It has to be, it has to do with, when you take off the halter and the lead rope, you've only got one thing left, it's a thing called the truth. If you can get good with horses, with those two things, and then your world will open up because when you get on his back, the perspective that you had on the ground will open up a whole new world to you. What's possible without using the reins? What's possible with just a light touch on the reins? What's possible with riding with precision with a light touch? What if we took the hair out of his mane, tied the bridle reins to the bit, and could get piaf and passage, could get the precision, could get everything that we've been dreaming of? Those are the ways that I know to be with a horse. And maybe there's more, but right now I know those for sure. For me, natural horsemanship is everybody's dream. It's, it's, you know, a lot of people talk today about the scientific study of how horses behave with each other, the ethology, that's all great. But I'm interested in the horse and human relationship. What does it take? What do we need to know? And I'll never forget Tom Dort saying, if I could just put an ounce of human into a horse, 
but a gallon of horse into a human, we would have one heck of a natural creature. And that's just what this is, natural horsemanship. Because this is what it's all about. Horses will respond to love, to language, and leadership in equal doses. I remember one of the first realizations that I had when I did a clinic with Pat, the very first clinic that I did, was I realized that even though I'd been in horses for 20 years and I was winning ribbons, that I had no idea what was important to horses. I had no idea what made them tick. And then I, as I began to study the program, over the years, I realized the more I knew, the less I knew, until one day, finally, it clicked for me and I really understood how to make it good for the horse how to have the horse really want to be with us, how to develop their confidence, how to get them to want to play, how to get them to want to leave other horses and come be with you. It's like no matter what you do with horses, unless you know what makes them tick, you'll always fall short of what they need you to be. I started about a dozen colts before I started Pirelli and I really thought I knew a lot. <laughs> and I thought I had a really good relationship with my horses before, but now when I go out to the corral, my horses all say, pick me, pick me. <laughs> I can ride him and do figure eights. So I can ride him all around Bridalist and Bareback. And that was the thing that um, convinced some of my friends. Uh, they were like, oh, Pirelli, I don't know about that stuff. And I'm going, well, whatever. And I just went about doing my thing. And uh, one day I had invited a friend over and she told her friend, and, and uh, I said, okay, and slipped the bridle off, and I'm loping around there making figure eights bridleless, and they're just like, they couldn't believe it. It's way more fun now having horses. Every time I wanted to do something like dressage or jumping or some, some fun stuff for a little competition or something, I got stuck because nobody really could help me. So with Pirelli, I came further than I ever thought. Like, I did things that I never thought I would do and it has developed me as a person, amazingly. <laughs> well, I don't worry so much. I know the answers are coming. And so I'm more relaxed about it. I'm not in a hurry. I don't have to prove anything. I feel freer. He's happier. He's um, more confident with me. He trusts me more. He looks to me for answers now, um, which is huge. I feel like we have a future. I think there's a couple of things that sets Pirelli apart from the rest. Um, the first is that basically we're the leaders in this, in this movement. And, uh, there's lots of people who have taken some of our methods and they're doing good work with it. But the origination is here. And I think the most important thing is that we put the horse so high in the hierarchy of things that we do. So we don't want to make horses do things. We use psychology, we use the love language and leadership. It's all about the relationship. And when you start to see the expression on horses' faces and how much they want to be with people, then you start to see the horses that don't, and you start to see why they don't. And I think that's the most important thing in this program. We want our horses to want us. We want them to want to be with us and to want to perform for us and with us, no matter what our goals are. If you 
are a high level performer and your horse greets you with his butt at the door, or worse still, comes at you with his ears back or his teeth bared, there's something wrong. You need a horse with this expression on his face, you know, wow, how can I, how can I be with you today and have fun? And you're much more interesting than my pals, my pasture mates. So getting a horse to want to offer things and to have that smile on his face is what it's all about. We've been producing uh, study programs since 1993, and uh, Pat was teaching well before that. You know, it's now some 25 years that he's been giving clinics and seminars and teaching. And uh, I think we're only just starting to hit our stride. I feel like now we really know how to empower people. We know how to explain what's going on for the horse and teach people how to read that and, and do it themselves. We've always had a certain amount of dependency that you know people need to go, oh, I can't do this myself or whatever. But now I think we can actually get people in love with learning, to not be afraid of it anymore. And the results are instant. You know, they just, I think empowerment is the word that keeps coming up. It, it empowers people because they feel like they can go out and they know something, they know how to solve their own problems. And best of all, their frustrations go away and they have fun. It doesn't matter what happens with a the horse, there's fun involved with it. And then because a lot of people have trouble, you know, staying motivated, we have a savvy club where every month we send you additional information and inspiration. So it feels like you're, you're in a club and you've got buddies studying with you and you get to see Pat and I every month in a different way um, that just keeps you on track. And I have this horse, it's not like you can just sell it. You know, I felt like I'm sort of stuck with this thing. And every time I would drive up to the barn, I would get nauseous. You know, I would just be afraid. I didn't even want to go, but I felt like I had to. And um, I had a teacher and he would basically just, he didn't recognize any of the problems I was having with my confidence and my fear level with this horse. And uh, I would just get on and do it. And I did it, I rode twice a week in lessons for about five years. I, I can't believe it was that long actually because I was terrified every time. I literally was desperate. You know, I would have done anything at that point. It didn't, I didn't believe that it was going to work. Nothing I've ever done on a DVD or a home study, yoga, cooking, none of that has ever worked out. So I, this home study thing, I was like, mm, I don't know. But I was literally desperate. I didn't know what else to do. And uh, the first day, just with the first DVDs, this horse used to drag me along and I could not control her. She would never walk behind me. And just being able to use some of the aids with the stick and the rope to keep the horse behind me, I was like, hmm, I'm on to something. And I actually was really just hooked from that moment on. It's so simple. It makes perfect sense. It's just so simple. Everything I was doing before was so much more difficult, you know, and so just the more you get into it and the more you learn about the horse psychology and how they think, nobody ever told me any of that stuff before. I had no idea. Prey animal, predator, all that makes perfect sense. First thing I really started noticing was her coming to greet me at the gate. You know, so it's just, it's hard to describe the difference. I'm so grateful to them. I was really interested in competing and when a friend talked to me about Pirelli, I was like, you know what, I'm really not interested in having my horse do circus tricks. You know, I, I, why would you ride bareback and bridleless? What on earth would be the point of that? You know, I want to compete. I want to do dressage. I want to show jump. So um, anyway, and so my friend was very persistent with me and eventually dragged me along to a level one clinic. And I got there and realized that this system went from very, very simple gross motor skills and very, very simple maneuvers where I was sitting there because I came from a competition background going, look at them, and um, realized that actually it went up to very, very advanced maneuvers and all the stuff that I wanted to do. And there was a system in place to do that. And I also realized that I didn't know nearly as much about horses as I actually thought. I um, didn't understand their psychology. I didn't understand a lot of the real things that were important to horses. You know, I knew what was important to me about horses, but I didn't have a clue what was important to them. I would say it's more than just a, a method of training. It's actually a way of being with a horse. Once you really get into this, there's no other way to be with a horse. There's no other way to interact with a horse. 
So, and it's a way of being with a horse that's based on something that's completely natural for the horse, completely, like the people that you meet are so positive and so into really doing the best for the horse and it keeps you moving forward. They're great, they play on the ground, they do these things on the ground before they get in the saddle and it, it just, it was so obvious when, when I actually stopped and thought about it. Before I just, I went along and I did everything that everybody else told me to do um, and didn't really think about it. I, I, was, I was relying on other people for my praise and recognition and, and for that I was doing well. I didn't really listen to the horse. Through this program I've, I've really grown a huge amount in confidence and I actually I compete now. But from my perspective, I think it is the best program for every person to be able to learn horsemanship. There are many great horsemen on the mountains, you know, here, there and everywhere, but this is the best program, I think, to, for everybody to learn horsemanship. It takes about two days to learn about Pirelli Natural Horsemanship. It takes a lifetime to master it. It's not for everyone. It's for the ones who want to dedicate their lives to their passion. When I, um, when I found Pat and what he was teaching, I realized it was everything that I was looking for, and I just had no idea it existed. I thought it was all about riding. I didn't know it was this journey that was truly transformational, you know, for me and for my horses and to put me in touch with my dream. And that's what we want to share with you. Thousands and thousands of students around the world are already experiencing it. And now we're being able to, to expand this message and bring it to even more people. That's why it's called horsemanship. A horse and a human on a ship, a vessel, taking a journey together.